it is imperative that we pay attention to who we're following, amen? We know like who we're, we're going behind. I wanna tell you guys a story that outside of first service, I've never told anybody. So this is like clergy confidentiality, is that all right? Just between us, right? No, I'm not gonna tell it if you're gonna like post it on YouTube. I mean, you guys are on YouTube, but whatever. Like, here's the deal, it was about three years ago, my family, we went on sabbatical, and we went, we, we lived overseas for kind of the summer of 2019. I can't believe it was almost three years ago. And has anyone else driven in a foreign country with different rules, or just me, right? Like, like they have the steering wheel on the wrong side of the car, they drive on the wrong side of the road. Their fast lane is on the wrong side, right? Like, it's a totally different experience. If you've never done it, I highly don't recommend it. <laughs> These different rules, different country. I'll, I'll never forget, we landed in England, and we were there to visit some good friends. We were going to meet them the next day. I got the rental car, and we went for a drive to this missionary house, this hostel that we were staying in for the week. And, and I remember driving, trying to, you know, follow. I was getting really kind of buddies with the, the Siri British man that I was listening to in the car. I'm driving to the, the hostel, and I look over, and I'm asking Jen for help as we go, and no joke, her head is like in her hands. I'm like, babe, I just didn't know it. She's like, I can't talk to you right now. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll not talk to you. We might die, but I won't talk to you. That's fine if that's what you want. And it was stressful, but we got there. I didn't run anybody over, I think, and we got to the house, and we got checked in, and the next morning, we met with our friends, and one of the first things I asked Jacob, and he had gotten there a few months before with the military, and I just said, hey, so what's it been like driving here? He's like, it's a train wreck. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm hitting curbs all the time, and, and I said, how about this? I will just follow you wherever we go. Oxford, wherever we go, I'm just going to follow you, and guys, I was an amazing driver that whole week. Like, I just followed him. He hit a lot of curves, but I was like, ooh, I'll miss that one, I'll miss that one. And we laughed about it, and we had a ton of fun, and by the end of the week, I really felt like I had this thing figured out. In fact, remember the night before we were gonna check out, they went back to their house, and again, this is a vintage family that's still a part of our church digitally and remotely, and, and we said goodbye. He said, are you gonna be okay getting to the airport tomorrow? I'm like, I am a pro. I got this thing figured out, no big deal. So he goes home, kids go to sleep. Next morning, we wake up, we pile into the car, and we get in the car, and, and Jen was like, man, it's been a great week. I'm tired, can I just fall asleep? I'm like, I got this, no big deal. So kids fall asleep, Jen falls asleep, I get on the highway, I move all the way over to the slow lane because I'm not in a hurry, I'm a big planner, so there's lots of time to get to the airport, I'm driving nice and slow, kids are asleep, I'm literally listening to worship music, praising God for his grace, his goodness, just enjoying this moment that I have with him, with the spirit, and him leading us. So I'm driving about 30 minutes down the road on the way to the highway, and I, I realize there's some sirens behind me. And I'm like, okay, no big deal. Like, I'll just get over. The problem is if you're in the slow lane and you get over, there is nowhere to get over, right, if you're a different country. And so I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't work. No big deal. I'm going slow. He'll go around me. And then he gets on his loudspeaker. Sir, I'm coming after you. Oh, okay, that's not what I was expecting. The kids wake up. Peyton starts bawling, my daughter. She's like, dad's gonna get arrested. I'm like, guys, no big deal. Like, I've not done anything wrong. I have nothing to be afraid of. This is not a big deal. Babe, I asked Jen, hey, I'm getting pulled over. So I don't know what's happening. Get my passport. And so we pull over. Now, you got to remember, pulling over means you're pulling over in the fast lane, right? So I'm like on the edge of the road. Cars are flying by. The officer comes over. And I told the kids, again, we're all good. I didn't do anything wrong. And so officer comes over. I roll down on my window. And I start to recognize, like, his hand's on his gun, and I'm like, what is happening? Like, this is getting real. My kids are freaking out, and I'm starting to freak out, but I'm like, I'm not gonna say anything, no big deal. He says, sir, get out of the car. And I'm like, can I just ask, like, what I did? Now, again, here's the good news. You know in these moments, like, little Andrew can come out, right? There's a little person inside each of us, our flesh. And by God's grace, like, I was calm. That's not normal. Like, I, I raised to the intensity, and instead I was like, okay, like, God, what are you inviting me into today, right? And so I'm sitting there, and his hand's on the gun, sir, get out of the car, and I'm like, can I just ask, like, what happened? Like, I, I'm, I'm confused. What's going on? And he's like, sir, get out of the car now. You need to get in my van. Now, at this point, I turn to Jen. I'm like, hey, will you take a picture of his license plate? Because I'm pretty confident I'm getting kidnapped. <laughs> like, I don't know why you think that's funny. It was terrifying. And I'm like, take a picture. But I'm also like, again, we've got good life insurance. Like, they might be better off without me. Like, God's got this. So I'm okay, but I just told them, okay, figure this out, and I go into the van, and the cop just starts grilling me. Who are you? What's your name? Why are you here? What are you doing? And I'm like, 
Well, like, so glad you asked. Let's talk about Jesus. No, actually, I was just very specific on the answers. I'm like, I'm a tourist. I'm here on holiday. I just visited my friends. He serves in the army, and, and I'm a pastor. And, and he's like, I don't believe you. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. I'm like, I don't got nothing else to say. The truth will set you free, right? Like, what am I supposed to say at this point? And so I'm like, staying calm. Okay, God, what are you inviting me into? And, and, and I say, sir, I'm, I'm really just confused. He's like, well, so am I. I'm on an emergency call right now. So in our language, it'd be like a 911 call. He's on an emergency call, and for two miles, I've been following you with my sirens on, and you've not been paying attention. I'm like, look, the Spirit of God must have been falling on me, and I was with him. I must not have seen you. Like, I find that hard to believe, but I'm sorry. Like, I was in no way, he thought I was impeding his investigation. In fact, he thought at one point, in fact, he said it this way. I, we, we've had so much fun this week laughing as a family at me. It's easy to do. He says, you were either intentionally trying to slow me down on this call, or you were the dumbest driver in the country. And I just said, sir, I affirm I am the dumbest driver in this country. <laughs> like, no joke. At that point, I think his partner, who was a totally different personality, she walked to my wife at the car and she said, hey, it's good. My, my partner's, it was an intense moment. It's calming down. Like, it's going to be okay. And it was, but it was stressful. And I learned something in that moment. Pay attention to who you follow. Pay attention because Siri in Britain did not cut it. You gotta pay, if I had Jacob, just my guide, and he offered, he said, hey, I'll even drive you to the airport. Like, just follow me. And I'm like, no, no, I got this. Guys, who we follow matters. And I know it's kind of a cute, funny story, but biblically speaking, this is all over the word of God. Biblically speaking, we see this reality that Jesus calls us outside of the empire to get off the throne of our heart and to faithfully follow him. But it feels like you're driving in a different country sometimes. You're fighting against your flesh, your natural tendencies, and every one of us needs a guide to walk with us as we follow Jesus. Paul says it this way. He says, church, follow me as I follow Christ. He says it regularly in his epistles. He writes to these churches that he's planted, that he's partnered with. He says, guys, it's gonna feel like an upside-down kingdom is the way Dallas Willard describes it. You're not gonna know what to do, and we need actual examples as to what it looks like, and that's what disciple-making is. It's us living in relationship with people, giving them an actual example for their good and for God's glory. And that's what Paul says. My summary statement for today is simply this. As disciple makers, we're inviting people into a personal relationship with us. We're inviting people into the car to follow us in their car. We're inviting them to journey with us. And the hope is that as they do that, they would see Jesus in us as we follow and imitate him. Discipleship is all about proximity and presence as we give people a front row seat to our joy-filled journeys with Jesus, the highs and the low, and the gospel growth that he is doing to us and through us. And so last week, we've been building on this Disciples Diamond series. Remember, this is not like a playbook. This is a pathway to building relationships. We started with identify. We become people that pray and watch and say, God, what are you doing around us? You're doing all sorts of things. Who are the people that you're naturally intersecting our lives with? Then last week, we looked at we invite. That's the first step. Say, follow me. Follow me, not because I'm the hero, but because I'm following the hero. His name is Jesus. We invite them in, and so today we're gonna talk about imitate because here's the reality. We start to look like the people that we're following. Can we make sure that we're following the right people, amen? People who are following Jesus because this is what we see in the Gospels in the New Testament. This is where kingdom movement happens. When we recognize at Vintage Grace, who are the disciple makers of our church? We are. Collectively, every single one of us, we are called by God to faithfully follow him, intentionally investing in relationships at the gym, as we coach, as we work, as we play, that we approach everything as this holistic calling to get off the throne of our heart and to faithfully follow him as king. And so I wanna read you a couple verses from Paul. It feels like it's all over his letters. It's all about faithfully fight for your joy and follow Jesus. Here's what he says, Ephesians 5, 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children. 2 Timothy 2, 2. What you've seen and heard in me, Paul, in the presence of many witnesses, entrusted now to faithful men who will also be able to teach others. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, which we just quoted. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Would you pray with me, Father God? We come before you and we pray for kingdom movement in our neighborhood, in our towns, and in our places of employment and our places of recreation. We pray that you would continue to help us speak to us about what it means to identify, to invite, and to call people to imitate you as we strive to imitate you. Spirit of God, I, I repent of all the moments in my life that I thought that I was a manager of meetings and of ministries and not seeing the way that you have called us to be disciple makers for your glory and for my friends' good. Would you speak to us? Would this not just be the way of Paul, but also the way of vintage, I pray, for your glory 
and for our good we ask this. And everybody said, amen. Now, 1 Corinthians 11 is where we're gonna start. Now, it's really important. When you read a book in the Bible, to not just take verses out of context. I mean, I'm all about favorite verses and bumper stickers and coffee mugs, that's great. But you know what comes before 1 Corinthians 11 is what? 1 Corinthians, you guys are so smart, man. Like, it's so good. 1 Corinthians 10, in 1 Corinthians 10, here's what Paul says. Everything in the world is all about the glory of God, everything. Everything, everything, everything. So if Paul says, hey, follow me as I follow Christ, why is he saying that? Because it's about the glory of God. This is what it's all about. It's about the glory of God. It's about his story, his kingdom movement, and his plan. Do all things for the glory of God. And so Paul says, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Why? Because on some level, you're gonna be happier and God's gonna get more glory because of it. That's what Paul's telling us as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Way too often I talk to people, especially high school, college students, young adults, 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds, and they often say, I just don't know what my calling in life is. Can I just give you an incredible gift right now? You know what your calling in life is? Son or daughter of the one true king. That is the most important thing about you. Way too often we think calling is like what we do professionally or are we married or do we have kids? None of that is calling. That's how you live out your calling. Your calling is son of God. That's your calling. And then your calling is as you follow Jesus, your calling, every one of us is calling is simply this, follow God and then invite other people to do the same. That's the mission. Master and mission, that's what we're talking about in this disciple-making series. That is our calling, and yet regularly I hear Christians, now I say Christians in quotes on purpose. I love the way the navigators say it. They say this, you're not a disciple until your disciple makes a disciple. That's what it means to be a disciple, to faithfully follow Jesus and to invite other people on that same exact journey, and yet I hear all the time people say, I'm not worthy of following. Is there anyone in the room right now that is not worthy of following? Raise your hand. And this is a two-hand moment of the service, right? Like, I'm not worthy of following. Paul is not worthy of following. It's who he's following is worthy of following. Does that make sense? Paul says, man, I'm the chief sinner. Jacob, again, we laughed. I mean, he hit so many curves as we were driving around. In fact, when we were driving in England, one of us got a flat tire. Guess who it was? It wasn't me. It was him. And we got to laugh about that. He's like, yep, that's why you're following me. And when we get flat tires, metaphorically, we get to talk about it. What happened in that reality? Well, I'm just not that good of a driver in a world that's backwards. That's what happened. We're faithfully following. It's not about us. It's not about Paul. Paul is not the hero. He's the chief sinner. Here's what Paul says to Timothy. This is like his protege, his disciple. They planted churches together. He's released him to go be a disciple maker, a multiplier for the kingdom. Here's what he says. The saying is trustworthy, deserving, and full of acceptance. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, that of which I am what? Foremost. I'm the best. I'm the first and the highest. Here's how he says it to the Ephesian church, chapter three, verse eight. I am less than the least. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse nine, he says, I'm the least of these. Now be very, very careful. Paul is not beating himself up. Is anyone out there insecure? Raise your hand. If you're not raising your hand, it's because you're insecure, right? (laughs) Everyone in this room is insecure, everybody. Every one of us. Paul is not saying, man, I just stink. I'm such a sinner. I'm no good. No one should be my friend. Nobody's gonna love me. Paul wrote a letter to the the church of, of Rome. It's probably our next big epistle we'll go through. He says this in chapter eight, verse one. Therefore in Christ there is now what? No condemnation. No condemnation. No condemnation. It's not that you're worth following. It's that who you follow is worth following. We all are the chief sinners. We all are this. My definition of a pastor is a professional sinner saved by grace. What I mean by professional is I went to seminary and spent a lot of money at Talbot School of Theology. My definition of a Christian is a normal sinner saved by grace. What is that difference between you and me? Seminary degree and some school debt. That's the difference. That's it. We're in the same situation, faithfully following Jesus as our rabbi. And so Paul is inviting us into this reality. He's not beating himself up. He's not saying, I'm the scum of the earth, I got nothing to offer. No, I have so much to offer you. Look at what he says. But I receive what? Mercy. I don't get what I deserve. As a sinner, God doesn't cast me away from his presence. He invites me near. He's not offended by my sin. He is, but then he runs towards the offense and he pays the price to make it right. Guys, this is the gospel. 
I am the foremost Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life, to the king of all ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. guys, this is, the, this is what we sing about. What happens on our spiritual journey with Jesus? We come to faith. We recognize that we're sinners. We recognize we need to repent God from our heart. We come to faith and we understand the cross. But my fear, especially in the Church of America, is that we celebrate something that I would call average grace. Average grace. How sweet the sound that saves someone kind of like You turned me off? Come on. So here's what happens. You recognize how bad you are and you recognize how holy God is. And what starts to happen in our journeys with Jesus? The cross grows. The grace of God is no longer average because it didn't save an average wretch like me. It saved a wretch like me. And that's what makes it amazing. And it's not that it's become more amazing. It's that we've recognized the depth of our depravity. And sure, it's going to be very clear. We haven't even come close to recognizing the depth of our depravity. Nor have we come close to recognize the holiness of God. You know that's what heaven is. The cross is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. And so again, Paul's not being insecure. He is not being depressing. He is not depressed. He says, guys, recognize this reality. Once we see who we are, once we see who he is, that frees us up to what? To worship to praise, to proclaim all glory and honor and power to you forever and ever. And everybody said, amen. Now again, church, don't miss this. My fear on some level is that then we say, man, I'm just so glad I have a personal relationship with Jesus. You've heard me say it before. You do, but it's short-sighted to say it's only a personal relationship. It's also corporate. It's also corporate. He saved a whole bunch of us who have gone off the throne of our hearts and have called us to himself. In fact, our definition of a disciple at Vintage Grace is not that you have R1, a deep new walk with God. It's not even that you have R2, a life-changing one with other believers, but you also have R3, an engaging one with the yet to believe. This is what a disciple is. It's in the middle. It's not one, two, or three. It's all three. This is what the disciple is. And please hear me, when I say to you guys as your pastor, are you happier tomorrow than you are today? What I'm saying, don't ever miss this, is that you're living R cubed that you're fighting for your joy in Jesus, that you're, you're confessing and repenting to him as Father, Son, Spirit, three in one, but also that you're doing that in the context of community. Why? Because, can I just be really honest, it's not fun to enjoy something amazing if it's all by yourself. There was this football game on last night. Did anybody catch a football game last night? Now, now again, it, it was an incredible journey. It was amazing, and part of it for me was, and I love it, because even the worship team's like, how many times are we gonna hear the 49ers today during the sermon? Just this one time. But it was incredible. Early on in the game, I was like, well, we're going to lose. Like, I'm texting with my buddy. He's a Packers fan. He goes to Vintage. Maybe he went to Vintage because he didn't come today. Maybe he's recovering. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm like, what a terrible first quarter. He's like, yeah, but we're not putting you away. And he's like encouraging me as a 49er fan. What a brother, right? <laughs> and as the game went on, and I, of course, did not text him at the end of the game. That would be mean, right? But it was during the game that, that really towards the end, because the Niners were only ahead at one point in the game when it mattered, Right? And when that happened, man, I chest bumped my son so hard that I thought I was going to break his back, right? Like, but have you ever tried to chest bump someone when there's no one else in the room? <laughs> right? Like, what is that? That's now a YouTube highlight. That's what that is. No, think about this. God has called us to experience the joy of Jesus, not just vertically, but horizontally too. Don't miss this. It's actually the joy gets doubled in another. The joy gets doubled when you can share it with somebody. The joy gets doubled when you're down and they get to help pick you up. The joy gets doubled when your brothers and sisters say, hey, and honestly, like at the beginning of the game, I'm like, well, we're gonna lose and I don't care. Some of that's OST, because I genuinely just don't care as much. But some of that is actually just this reality that I recognize the glory of God and football is football. It's fun, but it just doesn't matter. But we have people in our lives that are going to pick us up when we're down. We have other people in our lives that are going to actually help us celebrate. Why? Because celebration is more fun in community. God designed it that way. That's not a Drew or Vintage thing. That's straight from the book itself. We gather together as our two to pick each other up, to rejoice with those who rejoice, also to mourn with those who mourn. Don't miss this. When you hang out with happy people, what does that tend to make you? Happy. When you hang out with people that are depressed, what does that tend to make you? Depressed. Now, be careful. As the church, we are called to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. Don't walk into the hospital room and say, isn't this awesome? Don't walk into the, the, the cop police van and say, how cool! Look what God invited you into. Hopefully they respond that way, right? 
But we gotta be present with people in their brokenness, in their hurt, in their suffering. But church, our relationship with Jesus is not our one. It's our one, our two, and our three. Do we see that? That's what Paul is calling us to. And he's saying for four generational benefits. And this is what he says, 2 Timothy 2, 2. And again, Michael started here with our series a couple weeks ago. He said, I remember one of the first lunches I had with Drew. He was a student at William Jessup at the time and went to this Mexican restaurant. It was wonderful. And I said, hey, this is my life verse. You know why it's my life verse? Because it was my mentor's life verse. Because he walked me through this reality that this is God's plan for you, for your joy. This is what God wants for you. He doesn't want you to awkwardly chest bump the air. He wants you to be in communitas, common mission and common master, to fight for your joy. Here's what Paul says to Timothy. And what you, Timothy, have heard from me, Paul, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust now to faithful men. Give them the gospel who will then be able to teach others also. Todd Chapman, you've heard me talk about him probably a bunch. I still talk to him all the time. In fact, he texted me this morning. He says, Drew, remember Jesus matters more than the 49ers. I'm like, I know, but man, it was a good game. <laughs> Todd and I talk all the time. In fact, Todd was one of the ones. He was the one, the lead pastor at RCC, the church that we came from, that discipled me for the eight years before I came up here. Todd said, look, Drew, I'm gonna give you my life, but you better promise to give it away to somebody else. And you better call them to be ready to give it away to somebody else. This is disciple making. You see the four generations. I, Paul, to you, Timothy. You, Timothy, go lead men in your church. And you make it clear as you lead men that they are called to go lead others. Why? Because the call to disciple making is for all. That's why. Every single one of us has been given this call by God. I remember as a young preacher, people would say, man, you sound like Todd. And I was like, ugh. Like it was offensive. Because Todd, Todd's bald and he looks like Shrek. Have you ever seen a picture of him, right? So like for me, I was like, that's offensive, right? And Todd talks with a shriek. He's like, and this is recorded. Todd knows all this stuff. We're tight, right? Like, he gets it. And I remember they'd be like, you, you talk like Todd. And I'd be like, I don't sound like that. And then I watch sermons. I'm like, oh, I do. Why? Because you tend to imitate who you hang out with. You tend to start to look. Church, pay attention. People will look like the way in which we lead them to look. They'll talk and act, which is why it's imperative that Paul says, follow me, not because I'm worthy of following, but because who I follow is worthy of following. Todd would often say things like, well, you know, Drew, Todd rhymes with God, you know, so follow me, but only as I'm following God. That's the only way you should follow me if I'm following God. And I'd be like, yeah, well, Todd, Drew rhymes with who? Yeah, so let's be, you guys are good at that, and it's almost offensive, right? But like, that's cool, because it's not about Drew, it's not about Todd, it's not even about you, but make no mistake, I have a hope for you as your pastor that you're praying and watching and giving the gospel away that we recognize what God is doing, that as we look at a picture like this, that Todd was discipling me and that he calls me to disciple others and there's peer-to-peer -peer relationships as well. And I think this is often our picture. One of the things that I think that we miss though is that actually Todd as a leader better be a great follower. It's huge for me in the Church of America. We've created this leadership culture and my fear is actually there's only one leader. His name's Jesus. That he calls us to be faithful followers. So I found myself as I was following Todd, I would start praying for his wife, Julie, because we all know who's discipling Todd. I'd pray for Wally, who was discipling Todd. I'd pray for the men and the women that God put in Todd's life. And so I recognized that Todd needed to be following. And if he's not being a faithful follower of God, first and foremost, then he's not worthy of following. Same thing for anybody else in our life. Any of our micro church leaders, our, our group leaders, all of us are saying, hey, follow us, not because we're worthy, but because he who we're following is worthy. And we start to see how this works in the kingdom of God, this multiplication reality that he's invited you and me into, that it goes both directions, that it's for his glory and it's for other people's good, that we grow in our faith and we invite people in to have a front row seat to our faith. And the front row seat of our faith is not, look how amazing I am as a driver, Let's look at that curb and that flat tire and that brokenness. And that's the story of but man. But we get to tell the story of what? But God. But God is good all the time and he uses our brokenness. So we fail forward, church. Why? Because God is good all the time and he's using our brokenness for his glory and for his story. And so what happens is as people come and follow us, we get to share the gospel. As people are imitating us, we're inviting them into a front row seat. We have broken tires. We have flat tires. We can say, hey, this is my story. Let me introduce you to the real hero of my life. Let me introduce you who matters most in Drew's life. And we get to tell the story of the gospel. And again, we use this number line all the time, but we've added these shapes from Jeff Vanderstel. The first V coming down is that they came to us, Father, Son, Spirit. In the beginning, they created the world. 
The Father, Son, and the Spirit, three in one, came to us and made a perfect life in the garden. And in the garden, what did you and I, Adam and Eve, and you and me and everybody in between, what did we do? That's what the X represents. That's sin. We rejected that offer for perfect relationship. We not got off the throne of our heart. That's the X. And then the sideways V now is the gathered reality of the people of God, Israel, that are longing for a Messiah. They recognize that, again, they're, they're participating in Passover. They recognize they need a Passover lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. And so they're longing for a Messiah. And on this side of the cross, Jesus has come. He's lived. He's died. He's resurrected. He's won. And so now this new sideways V is what? That's the church. And so what we're doing in this reality is we're inviting people into relationship with us. But this far arrow matters. The down V, of course, is that he's coming again. Anybody else excited for Revelation? Two more weeks, right? He's coming back. Not, not in two weeks. I don't know. He could. It'd be great. It'd make my job a lot easier to preach through a book if he just comes back first. But he's coming back again. Now, until that day, this yellow sideways V, I want us to pay attention. We're inviting everybody into a journey with Jesus. Follow me, imitate me, but only in the way in which I imitate Christ. There's a joyful journey with Jesus. Follow me as I follow him. This is the gospel. Vision is caught. It's not taught. But still teach the gospel. Every morning when you wake up, preach the gospel to yourself. Remind yourselves, God made me for relation with him. My sin broke that. He redeemed and rescued that, and now I faithfully follow him, imperfectly, with broken, limping forward. The gospel is best learned in lab format, not in lecture. I, I, don't, I don't think sermons is really the best way to learn the gospel. It's on the side of the road in England. It's on the, the, the gym floor. It's at Oak Ridge High School. Those are the best places on the football field, wherever we are. Why? Because we get to tell the story of the gospel. We get to build relationships. We get to call people to imitate us as we imitate Christ. Like, I like preaching. I think it's actually from God, of God, and for God, and for the edification of the body. But honestly, sermons are just the tip of the spear. That's all it is. Sermons are like an alley-oop. So you can go into a community of faith and how do we live this out? Because the best sermons at Vintage Grace are never on Sunday mornings. They're always on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's when the gospel gets fleshed out. It's why Jesus came in the flesh, to live the gospel, to show the gospel, to invite us in to relationship in the kingdom. So although the sermons are the tip of the spear, really it's the relationships that are driving our gospel kingdom movement. That's what it is. It's you guys, it's why we say at Vintage, the best part of our, of our Sunday gatherings. I love our singing, I love our stories, I, I appreciate most of our sermons. Here's the best part, when you go live the gospel. When you get to do that in the context of community. And I got to see that, I get to see it all the time as a pastor around here. Thank you for fighting for your joy. One of the things I've done here for years, we've done about 15 of these, is we've done Desiring God groups just a small group of men and, and sometimes of women that are just fighting for our joy and, and I've gotten to lead people through that process. Guess who led me in my first Desiring God group? Todd. I get to help other people now do that. Why? Because as Todd invests in me and I invest in you, I'm calling you now to go invest in your Pray Watch community. One of the greatest joys I had was maybe three years ago, one of our elders just came and said, hey, can I take the Desiring God class again? And I'm like, was I just that bad of a teacher? Like, what did I do? He's like, no, I just, I want to lead a group through it. And I took the first time for me and my walk with Jesus. Now I want to take it so I'm ready to lead others. Now, again, you don't have to lead a group. You're leading people whether you're in a group or not. But I love that. I love that I saw that in him. Another one of our group leaders said the same thing. Gabe Garcia, our church parent in Oakland, he's doing the same thing with his life group leaders right now. How do I invite them in to understand the gospel, to actually see what this number line means, how it gets played out Monday through Friday? One of the greatest highlights for me was when our youth pastor at the time, Michael Dacey, who's still youth pastor but also teaching, he says, hey, I want to lead young adults through this. Is that okay? I said, absolutely. I didn't write the book. I just tell you about it. It was inside of one of those Desiring God groups that one of his YA leaders came to faith. He said, man, I recognize what it means to get off the throne of my heart, to desire God, to have affections for God, to change my heart from the inside out. That same guy is now currently on staff. He's helping lead our students. In fact, on Wednesday night when I was like, after nine o'clock, does anyone else turn into a pumpkin or just me, right? Like, so youth group, I, I, sometimes I'm like, I can't bring my kids home. And he says, I'll take your kid home. And now this guy that, again, I've not necessarily spent time personally discipling, but one of my disciples has discipled. Guess what he's doing now four years later? He's discipling my sons. Guys, there's nothing better. This is what God wants for us. It's not about a gathering on Sundays. I love Sundays, but the best part of Sundays is that we send you to go make disciples, to go be the living proof of a loving God, to live in the context of community. Why? Because there's a power of multiplication that God is doing. Church, my hope, my prayer since we moved here was that Acts 19 would actually happen in our city. What I mean by that is it would be hard for anyone to live in El Dorado Hills and go to hell because they keep seeing heaven in the people of God. 
That's been my prayer. And that only happens when one of us, all of us, every one of us says, who's our one? Who's our one that God has sent us to disciple? And when we do that, there's a multiplication effect. Jesus had his beloved in John. He had his inner three, which was Peter, James, and John. He had people that he invested in, and he invested in them with the hope and the call that they would then go invest in others, that they would follow him and they would invite others to do the same. And you see what happens when generational ministry starts to take place. One of the great joys I have serving here as pastor is actually seeing the amount of people that are getting baptized. I don't know who they are. I don't even know who their disciple makers are. I just get a front row seat to kingdom movement, to you guys living as sent ones, not to the first generation, not even to the second or to the fourth or to the seventh, but all the way to the ninth. There's guys in my life like Wally Norling that I'm so thankful for, and you'll never meet him. You don't have to. Wally's not the hero, but Wally disciple Todd. And we get the fruit of that reality. Church, who has God called us to disciple? That's what this whole workbook has been about. Everyone has one. Disciples are made here. We've been praying and watching and stepping and inviting people. What are we inviting them to? To imitate us as we imitate Jesus. That's what we're calling them to. This is how the gospel goes from Jerusalem to El Dorado Hills. Think about that. Acts chapter one, verse eight. Here's what Jesus says before his ascension. You're gonna be my witnesses. You're my disciple makers. And you're gonna go make disciples in all of the world. He says this, start in Jerusalem, then go to Judea, Samaria, and then go where? El Dorado Hills. Into the earth is actually what it says. But for them, that was El Dorado Hills. This is the gospel. This is the plan of God that he's invited us into. So what are the implications? Because there are a ton of them. Here's the first one. We started three weeks ago. Identify, may we just be a praying church? We just be people of God that are praying and watching, saying, God, what are you inviting us into? That really is one of the big ideas of Revelation, that we might just see what God is doing in front of us. That we might just recognize and then respond and engage in his kingdom, not in our own. So may we be people that pray and watch as God is intersecting our lives together. May our alarms continue to go off at 938 that reminds us to not settle for the empire, but that we are kingdom residents. As we identify, may we also recognize a second implication is invite. Did Jesus ever preach to large crowds? Yeah, he fed the 5,000, he talked to them. There's nothing wrong with a large gathering. But where did he spend the majority of his time investing? In the 12, with a small group of men that he called to be disciple makers. Now he had the 72, he had medium-sized groups as well. He sent the 72 out. He had smaller groups like the three or John, the beloved one. The point is this, is he gave us a model for what it looks like to be disciple makers because he is actually the rabbi that all of us are following. And I think it's important that we recognize that proximity and space and seasons matter. None of us can really disciple 72 people. Jesus did 12, we should pay attention, right? He's God, he's got a little bit of an advantage on us. But it's, it's proximity, it's living life. It's living and, and leading in our brokenness together. I don't spend as much time with Dave as a former professor that I used to. I still spend time with Todd, but again, seasonally, there might be places and spaces that God brings people into your lives and out, but the question is, who right now is the one that you are discipling? Who's the one that you are following? Who are you imitating and who is imitating you? That's been the whole point of this entire series, and that really does get to our third implication today, which is that we are imitators, we're all imitating someone and something that comes out. Here's what Paul says, Ephesians 5, 1. So my life verse, here's my wife's life verse. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. When the word therefore is there, we must ask what it's there for, right? Chapter 5 comes after chapter 4. Chapter 4, Paul says this. You are a part of the bride of Christ. There's a unity in Christ. There's a communitas being formed, a common master and a common mission. And then now you have life in Christ. So you take off the old self and you put on the new. What is the new? Be like Jesus. Therefore, be imitators of Christ. Start to look like him. You actually don't want your disciples to look like you. You want them to look like Jesus. But has anyone else noticed that your kids start to look like you? Physically and sinfully? Right? Have you ever seen sin in any of your kids and been like, oh, I know where they got that from? Their mother. <laughs> right? Like you see it and you're like, oh, that's my anger. That's little Andrew. Like I've apologized to my kids when they're sinning because I know where they got it from. Right? Because we're all imitating the people that have gone before us. Pay attention to who you're following. Pay attention to your guide in this leadership culture of America. Repent of that and say, no, I want to be a follower of Jesus. That's what a disciple means, that I get off the throne of my heart and I follow him. And so church, just to be very clear here, people are following you. People are following you because my hope is they see a joy in you and they're like, I want some of that, so I'm gonna try that. 
We have yet to believe people that come to church all the time just because their friends that love Jesus are happier than them. That's okay. That's actually good. That's called evangelism. We just have to introduce them to why we're happy. His name is Jesus. It's not because our circumstances are perfect. It's because we're striving to faithfully follow Jesus. That's what matters. And so as people imitate us, here's the biggest cry that I have for you today. Make sure we're imitating God. We're not imitating the person before us. It's not bad if you sound like the preacher. It's just make sure it's about Jesus and not about anybody other than him. And so this is why Paul says, therefore, be imitators of God. Don't imitate me other than the way that I'm following him. And so I want to invite you, if you have your books, to pull them out, that this week I want to encourage us to take some time as a church to say, I want to imitate God. Does anyone here need to imitate God better? Am I the only? We're not there. We're in process, every one of us. And so Jesus came to earth not just to die for our sins. That's a big deal. Don't miss that. He also came to show us how to live in the kingdom. Why? Because we need a guide because it's an upside-down kingdom. All those feelings in England driving on the wrong side of the road, that's what it means to leave the empire and to fight for your joy in the kingdom. We need guides to do that, which means that people are looking to us as guides. Every one of us, you're like, I'm not a disciple maker. Yes, you are. You're arguing with Jesus. You take that up with him or put it on your connect card, right? Or send, send me an email, jens at vintagegrace.org and I'll meet with you, right? No, people are following you. Make sure they see Jesus in you. And so this week, we're gonna tend to spend some time we're gonna practice some spiritual disciplines. Why? Because I want God to change me from the inside out to make me look more like him if people are following me. Here's what Dallas Willard says. He says, disciplines are activities within our power that enable us to accomplish what we cannot do by direct effort because we meet the actions of God with us. That's grace. I love this reality from Dallas Willard. He says, look, I can't be a good Christian. Stop trying to be a good Christian. Recognize that you serve a good God. Now, in that journey, say, God, how can I become more like you? For my joy and for your glory and for the good of people that are following me, how can I become more like you? The effect of discipline, then, is to enable us to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. It's like muscle memory. It's like I'm sitting in that cop van, right, the officer's van, and I'm like almost having an out-of-body experience. I'm like, hey, this is cool. Like, I might be getting arrested, but I look more like Jesus than I thought I did. I'm not responding in the flesh. I'm open-handed. I'm saying, God, what are you inviting me into? I believe this. You know how that happens? Is when God helps you with your lack of belief. When you faithfully follow, when you say, Lord, I don't want Drew, I want more of you. I want less of me and more of you. And we don't celebrate Drew because his name rhymes with poo. We celebrate the grace of God that makes us more like him. And so spiritual disciplines are a way for you and I. So I'm excited to invite you this week into spiritual disciplines. It's a gift from God because Jesus modeled life in the kingdom and we just want to follow him, be imitators of him. And so again, two different categories Willard put spiritual disciplines in. One is this, the discipline of abstinence. Now, we don't like to practice that because we're Americans and we think that more is always better, right? And so the discipline of abstinence means I'm gonna get rid of something in my life for a short period of time, maybe a long period of time, for the purpose of God to be glorified and me to recognize that what I really need in my life is Jesus. And so here's just a couple that I encourage you to pray about. They'll come up in your workbooks this week. The first one is this silence and solitude. Jesus regularly withdrew. It was a habit of his. He'd teach large crowds after every time. You know what he did? He ran away to sit with the Father because that's where more joy is in relation to the Father. And so he regularly withdrew. I talk to all the time. They're like, I just wish God would talk to me. And I, of course, ask the question, have you spent any time listening? He actually does talk. Have you spent any time reading and being still? And so, of course, this week, we're going to talk about listening and being still, listening to God, listening to other people. I'd encourage you, create habits of goodness for God to work in your life. One of those for me is silence and solitude, like Jesus practiced. Another one is fasting and frugality. Spend less so you're freed up so that money, because here's the reality, either you own money or money owns you, right? For way too many of us, it's what drives us. And again, we're saying, I'm going to do less of that and more of saying, God, you sit on the throne of my heart. It's not that I, I can't afford something, it's that I don't want that because it's gonna own me. And I wanna make sure that I recognize that I'm a bond servant of Christ, I'm a follower of him, he sits on the throne of my heart. So frugality is a discipline we try to practice regularly. Fasting is a discipline we try to practice regularly. Jesus led by the Spirit in Luke chapter four, he goes, leads him out into the wilderness. Anybody remember? For the temptation. He also, for 40 days, what does he do? He fasts. He says, Lord, I'm gonna get rid of food for this season for the purpose of hearing from you because you are the bread of life, because you are all that I need. 
because you are all that I desire. Give me more of you. And so we're gonna spend time this week as a church as we pray through our workbooks together and we're gonna use Saturday as a day to fast as a church. Now, again, there's a difference between just fasting to be like the Pharisees and contorting your face and being like, oh, I'm fasting. Instead of saying, no, I wanna fast for something. God, I wanna, I wanna meet you in this moment. I want you to speak to me. So I'm gonna get rid of something so I create more space to pray, to watch, to step so there's an article on day 22, that's where we're gonna start this week and our Disciples Made Here booklets this week is what are we fasting from? And more importantly, what are we fasting for? How do we fast for the work of God to be in our lives? How do we fast so that we might say, God, we wanna see kingdom movement in our neighborhood. We wanna pray and watch and step. We wanna get rid of the things that distract us. And then what we're gonna do as a church is we'll fast on Saturday and then we'll come back on Sunday for this great commissioning on the 30th. And then we'll break our fast together for break. Fist. Is that cute, right? I do, I do lame really well. It's one of my fortes. So we'll break our fast and we'll have breakfast. We've got a bunch of breakfast burritos. We'll fast on Saturday. We'll come back and break our fast together and say, God, would you do a work here like you did there? Would you create in us a communitas with a common mission and a common master and a common sending that every one of us is a sent one? And would you do a work? And so we're gonna spend this week, we've been spending this month, heck, we've been spending the last eight years that we've been a church preparing for this moment for us to be sent ones, for us to live on mission. I think disciplines help us look more like Jesus as we call people to follow us as we follow him. There's disciplines of abstinence, also disciplines of engagement. Now these are ones we practice more often. We think they're more fun, right? Because we don't have to get rid of anything. We go to church, we party. We chest bump Jesus, we chest bump our brothers, we engage in communitas, we sing songs, we study. Did Jesus study? Yeah, I remember when he was 12 and he's in the temple and they're like blown away by his knowledge. He knew more than the rabbis, why? Because he loved the word of God. We see regularly, in fact, it says in, in chapter four of Luke, as well as in Mark and other books, that as was his custom, he would go to the synagogue. Jesus had a spirit of worship. Everything he said and did, his head, his heart, his hands was worship and celebration. It's totally fine to sing by yourself, but there's something about being in a room and singing about the glory of God. Church, I love Sundays. You guys are all in the church choir. You are the church choir. We're celebrating God. We're, we're gathering for service and for fellowship. Jesus says, I came to serve, not to be served. He came in Mark 10 to be a servant. Now, the one discipline that Jesus doesn't practice that you and I should is confession. Why? Because he's Jesus. He came to make a way for our sins. And he said, hey, please confess. Why? Because I and my Father will be faithful and just to forgive you if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And so we practice these disciplines. We practice the disciplines of prayer and submission. 25 times in the Gospels, we see Jesus went away to pray. And every prayer, church, every prayer is a prayer of surrender. That's why I often I'll pray with my hands open because every prayer is a prayer of surrender. Where do we get that from? From Jesus. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is talking to the Father, he says, God, I'll do whatever you want, Dad. Whatever you want, Father. But if there's another way to save the world, can we do it that way? Remember that prayer? And the Father says, no, this is the way. And what does Jesus say? He says, not my will, but thy will be done. It's a prayer of surrender.